Hi, I'm Daniel Chan from UNSW Sydney. Welcome to another adventure in pure mathematics. In this video, I want to give you a working definition of a coherent sheaf on a quasi-projector variety, which generalizes the definition that I gave in a previous video in this playlist uh, for coherent sheaves on the projective line. And the perspective that I want to take is that of manifold or descent data um, perspective. Okay, so let X be some quasi-projective variety over some uh, algebraically closed field K. So in other words, you look inside projective space and you look at some uh, open subset of a closed subset of that projective space. So that's a quasi-projective variety. Um, some people like to also uh, uh, add the condition that this uh, uh, locally Closed subset is also uh, irreducible, so that's quite common as well. Okay, so let's think back to manifolds firstly. So you've also got a theory of sheaves for, for manifolds. Um, uh, but let's uh, think about how you build a manifold. Okay, so a manifold is something that is locally Euclidean. So one way to think about it is that you can uh, build it uh, by essentially gluing open balls inside Euclidean space together. Okay, so what about a quasi-projective variety? Okay, so uh, similarly, um, this is an object uh, which you can uh, say is a locally an affine variety. Okay, so it has an open cover, and you can picture like this, where each of the uh, open sets in this open cover are actually affine varieties. And we can try to think of this quasi projective variety as uh, you basically glue these affine varieties together. And I want to show you how you do this, and in fact, um, the setup that I've given here allows you to talk about coherent sh uh, sheaves on not just a quasi-projective variety, but um, uh, schemes which arise in this way. Okay, so this is quite a, a general sort of a setup. Okay, so here X we're going to assume is the union of these open uh, subsets U1 up to UM, and these are going to be all affine. So they're affine varieties, and uh, so uh, let the coordinate ring of this uh, affine variety UI be RI. So we're going to write UI equals spec RI. And you can think of this, if you know about schemes, you can think of this as a scheme, but otherwise you just think of this as the corresponding variety whose coordinate ring is uh, K, uh, is this RI here. Okay, so we're going to have to try to uh, glue these various uh, patches together. So we need to know about the intersections and we need good uh, notation for that. So I'll use UIJ to be the intersection of UI and UJ. If I have three indices, U, I, J, L, that's just the triple um, intersection of these. Uh, similarly, we'll uh, do, uh, denote the coordinate rings of these intersections of these open sets with R with appropriate subscripts. I guess R, I, J is just the cornering of um, U, I, J, and so forth. So the question is, okay, you want to think about this um, uh, X as being built up from these affine varieties and we'll think of them as separate now, separate affine varieties, and we want to glue them together, okay, to get to you this X. Okay, so how do we glue the UI together? Okay, let's start bit by bit. So the way we'll do that is we'll start by gluing uh, two of these um, affine patches together. So let's suppose we look at this, just the black bit here, and we want to glue UI to UJ, okay? So what do we do? Um, it's similar to what happens with manifolds, you need uh, transition functions there. So first you identify an open subset of UI, which is the intersection, and an open subset of UJ, which is the intersection, and you have an isomorphism between them. Okay, so the way I'm going to do it, it's a little bit more general, it's uh, and less asymmetric. I'm going to basically abstractly think about a third object, which is the intersection of these two, uij, and I'm going to have this uij, there's an inclusion map into this ui, and an inclusion map into this uj, and it's going to identify this uij with an open subset of this ui, and an open subset of this uj, and that's the way I'm going to basically give the um, transition function, so to speak, the isomorphism between ui to uj, the gluing, so to speak, between them, okay? So basically, uh, the things that in here that get glued to here are those which come from this uij, and which point do they get glued to? Okay, the corresponding point there is going to be the image of that one there, and vice versa. Okay, so that tells you how to glue those uh, things together. Of course, unlike the case of the projective line, where you could take an open cover with just two uh, affine lines, so th there are only two affine patches, you could have three and more. Okay, so um, I want to talk a little bit about that um, as well. So if you look at the rest of this diagram, say for example, you want to go to UJ to UL, you have a similar uh, triangular sort of a diagram here. And also, uh, if you want to glue UI to UL, you can do it uh, in two steps via J and then from J to L, 
or in one step from uh, using URL as well. Okay, so these are all the double intersections of two of those patches, and you can also talk about the triple intersection. So that'll be inside here, and you have the inclusions of UIJL into each of these double intersections. Okay, of course you could go further, and sometimes it's important to look at that. Okay, but for the moment that's going to be enough for us. Okay, so that's just looking on the geometric side, and remember this is algebraic geometry, so by the algebra geometry duality, uh, to understand this you can just look on the commutative rings, the coordinate rings of everything here. So let's look at the coordinate rings of everything here, and we just reverse all the arrows, okay, that's what we do. So in particular for this little bit of a triangle, okay, let's just see what happens there. You'll have a map from Ri, um, the corner ring of Ui, to Rij, the corner ring of Uij, and also a map from Rj to Rij. Okay, and if these define uh, basically uh, open subsets like that, well then you'll have this sort of diagram and similarly for the rest of what goes on here. Actually, this um, diagram that you see on the right hand side is quite nice. Um, there's a, a, a simplification. Um, well, it works fairly generally, but the easiest way to state it is when X is irreducible. So just to remind you, uh, when is a variety uh, Reducible, okay, that means that you can make it the union of two um, closed subsets such that um, those two cl closed subsets are not like one contained in the other, okay? So you can actually kind of write it as more than one component, okay? So let's suppose this is ir irreducible, okay? Then we can talk about the field of rational functions. So usually when you study quasi-projective varieties, you have this condition in there. Uh, but some people have the more general condition uh, that doesn't have this. Okay, so um, you can look at the field of rational functions in there. Okay, And the point is that really, uh, one way to think about all these coordinate rings for these open subsets is that they all sit inside this. Because uh, what's one way to define? What is the coordinate ring of ui or any open subset uh, of this x? Okay. Um, if it's an affine uh, set, okay, it's basically just the set of all rational functions um, which are well defined on that set. Okay, so you have, uh, so that means that they're all strictly sub algebras of this kx, and you can look inside here. Okay, so when we do this, actually, um, at least for the uh, case that x is. Um, a projective variety actually you can assume that all these intersections are also affine as well okay so that's that's something that we have okay great so uh, what's a coherent sheaf okay we can come to the definition of that now um, and we'll start uh, with the notion of quasi coherent sheaf which is a little bit more general uh, we'll denote it with a script m on x so we're going to follow a similar procedure to what we did with the projective line okay so firstly we need a sheaf on each of the patches, and a coherent sheaf on an affine variety is just a module over the corresponding coordinate ring. So Mi is an, uh, an Ri module, okay, and you need one for each of the patches. And then what you need to do is, uh, okay, so you've defined it here, and you define it here, so remember sheaf is basically on every open s uh, subset of this, you need to give some sort of an abelian group, uh, it's a sheaf of abelian groups. So you want to say, well, on the intersection, um, they define the same thing. Okay, so the way we'll do it is we'll glue, okay, and that's the descent data, and that's something that we also saw in the case for coherent sheaves and quasi-coherent sheaves on the projective line. So we need this uh, gluing data, this descent data, uh, so theta ij, okay, so what we do is we restrict the patch on mi uh, to um, the intersection, so that's rij turns out ri, this ri module mi, so remember ri maps to rij, ri maps to rij, so you can do this tensor product here, and you get this, um, and you can do something similar by restricting the sheaf on the MJ, another p patch, uh, to the intersection, so Rij turns it over the other one, Rj, MJ, and you want an isomorphism, and this is an isomorphism of Rij modules, okay, and this is for any pair of Rj, okay, so you have all these gluings together, okay, um, but what's different now is because there's more than two patches, you've got to be careful, okay? So you want to say, well, suppose you want to take the patch here and you glue it to the patch that's over here, okay? So you identify them like that. And then you, you, what you can do is you can do, on the triple intersection of three of them, you identify that to the one on U3. That will allow you to, to identify the, the part on U1 to U3, but you can also go directly using the theta IL, 
okay? So one, three in this case, okay? And you want to make sure that those are the same. So essentially, the way I'll write down this condition is that theta IL is equal to uh, theta IJ composed with theta uh, LJL, and that's going to be on the triple intersection, so that's its RIJL modules, okay? So I guess really, um, maybe I should say, uh, this is more for, um, if you want this to work properly, probably I want to work with projective varieties, um, the way I've set it up here. Okay, so that's the first thing. The other thing is that uh, because this is for all IJ, um, I'm going to look at uh, I, um, theta ii as well as including here. So this is often a good thing to do, is to have this included. And so, uh, so, so why is that? Uh, so if I um, impose this condition here, uh, what do we find? Um, uh, you're just gluing basically the sheaf on one patch to itself, okay? And of course, you want that to be an identity, okay? And one of the things that that means is, for example, is if that L equals I, this is theta II, that's the identity, that means that if you do um, IJ, uh, theta IJ, that's um, the inverse of theta JI. Okay, so if you glue one to the other, and then you can also glue uh, in the reverse direction, that's going to be the inverse. Okay, and that's what you would want. Okay, so that's one of the reasons, that's the reason why we put this here, essentially. Okay, so um, it's a little bit different from the definition uh, that we gave for if, if, if x is a projective line, the definition we gave before, and that's because um, we've got a few more uh, uh, theta ij's, but they're all kind of don't give you any extra information because um, the theta ii's are all uh, given uh, by the identity, identity. And so before, for the projective line, we had uh, how to glue from one patch to the other, and the point is that if you have the gluing in the opposite direction, it's just the inverse, okay? So let's just see precisely what this means, okay? So if you do the theta ij, really you want it on the triple intersection, so I need to tensor that, um, restrict to the triple intersection by tensoring by rijl. So that gives you, you tensor this by rijl, you'll get rijl tensor over rimi, so that's what happens when you tensor over this, okay? Uh, to rijl tensor uh, mj, and then you do the theta jl, so you tensor this with the j and l instead of i and j, so you go from Rijl tensor Mj to Rijl tensor ML. Or you can go directly. Okay, that's a theta IL, and that's what you have here. And you want to make sure that these, uh, th this composite map is the same as this one here. Okay? And this is called the co-cycle condition that we have. And if you have this co-cycle condition on this data here, okay, then you will define a quasi-coherent sheaf on M. Okay? So what's a coherent sheaf? That's a special type of uh, quasi-coherent sheaf that occurs when all these modules here, MI, are finitely generated. Okay, and um, so you can talk about the class of all of these objects, the class of all quasi-coherent uh, sheaves, M on X is going to be Q co X, that's the fairly common notation for that, and the class of all coherent sheaves is co X like that. So we'll talk about morphisms later, so these will actually be categories. Okay, so I guess that's quite a lot of uh, data here. So let's just give some uh, one good uh, example at least. So the most important example is the structure sheaf. Okay, and by convention, it's denoted by this uh, color graphic O subscript X. And it's actually a coherent sheaf. Okay, and what's the definition? So I need to give you these modules, RI modules, and it's just going to be the regular uh, module here. So MI is going to be equal to RI. So MI is equal to the RI. So basically, we have all this diagram here, okay? <laughs> okay, so, uh, and then what you need is you need all these um, uh, descent data, okay? So uh, if you have RI, this is MI is RI, MJ is RJ, but when you tensor up with RIJ, okay, they both become RIJ naturally, okay, because they both uh, sit in like that. So they, this is just RIJ, an isomorphism of RIJ to RIJ as RIJ modules. And we're going to pick the most natural one, just the identity here. Okay. So we've given the data for a quasi-coherent sheaf, in fact a coherent sheaf, because this is finitely generated as an RI module. And you just need to check this condition here. And that's pretty easy because essentially all these maps are identities. Okay. So this is identity composed with identity is identity. And that gives you the most important uh, example of a coherent sheaf. Okay, so now we're going to come to the notion of morphisms between quasi-coherent sheaves. So suppose this script M and script N are two quasi-coherent sheaves, so the way we've defined them um, as uh, uh, modules MI with descent 
data theta ij and say modules ni with descent data rho ij. A morphism from a script m to script n, let's call it phi, is given by what? So we're going to mimic exactly what we saw in the case of quasi coherent sheaves on the projective line. Okay, so firstly, on each of the patches, you want a morphism of sheaves, which just means a module homomorphism. So for each i, you're going to have an ri linear map from mi to ni. And then, of course, you want them to agree on the intersections. Okay, so, uh, well, how do they uh, behave on the intersection? So you have the descent data, which tells you how they combine. Okay, so on the intersection, what is f phi i? So basically, you tensor by rij to get this, you, this map rij tensor phi i. On the patch, uh, which is above j, uj, it's just rij tensor the phi j. And of course, this is the gluing that tells you how they glue together. So you want this diagram here to be commutative. Okay, uh, and this is a commutative diagram of rij module homomorphisms. Okay, so if you're given this data such that all these diagrams commute for every pair of ij, then you have a morphism of quasi coherent sheaves. Okay, and the uh, uh, morphisms of coherent sheaves are just precisely um, the case when both m and n are coherent. Okay, so that's a full subcategory. Okay, okay, so the fact here is that uh, this. Uh, this category of quasi-coherent sheaves and coherent sheaves. So I guess that uh, the definition of uh, composites of morphisms is quite natural because you can compose these homomorphisms together and then see that if this commutes uh, if for those uh, two morphisms of quasi-coherent sheaves, then the composite will also um, uh, commute as well. So you get categories. In fact, they're k-linear abelian categories. So you can talk about direct sums. Okay, so the homos between them will be a vector spaces over k. And also, you can talk about kernels and co-kernels and things like that. <coughs> okay, so let's come up with some more um, examples. And here I have to be a little bit more sketchy how I describe things. But this is a very important um, uh, example that he, uh, we have here. So uh, let's look back at the case of uh, the projective line. So we saw examples of what were um, uh, skyscraper shapes. And I want to generalize that. So skyscraper shapes correspond to a point on the projective line and you have a corresponding skyscraper shift here, there. So I want to look now more generally at just some closed subset D of X. So it could be a point, in which case this description here will give us a skyscraper shift at that point, but it could be something more general, a more general closed uh, sub-variety. And I'm going to firstly define a coherent subshift O minus D of OX. Remember this is an Abelian category. Okay, so we can talk about subshift. Um, so OX, remember, is where these uh, M, I's are all RI. So basically, I want to sh give you uh, sub-modules uh, of that. In other words, ideals. This is an example of an ideal shift, O minus D. Okay, so I minus D will s say um, on each patch, I've patch will be MI, and then you'll have this theta IJ, which will just be a restriction of what goes on here for OX. Okay, so what's MI? Okay, so basically, this is just going to be all the functions which are zero on this D. Uh, since fi is really only defined on ui, so you can say it's 0 on d intersect ui. Now, it's a fact, if you set things up properly um, with your affine uh, varieties, that if you have rij tensor ri of mi, then um, what is this equal to? So this is also just a um, set of functions inside rij now. And which functions are those? As you can sort of guess, it has to be uh, the functions uh, which are uh, 0 on d intersect this uij. So if if you don't fully understand this, I'll do an example so that at least in this example you see what's going on. And perhaps that's the most important thing for you to um, get out of this. Okay, so um, what you find here then, once you have this fact here, okay, it's very easy to see that if you change i and j, right, this is just the same set, okay, it's just the f inside rij, uh, such that it's a zero on d in stick uij, and it doesn't matter whether you swap the order of the i, I and the j around, okay, or you switch the i and the j. So, um, since, remember, what is the theta on OX? That's the identity. Well, it's going to restrict to a, um, uh, a descent data on these MIs. Okay? So that means that you do actually have a coherent subsheet of OX, and that we call O minus D. Okay? So since you have a subsheet, you can talk about the quotient. Okay? And uh, this is an abelian uh, category, and that's going to be my OD. And that's a coherent shift since OX is a coherent shift. Okay, all these, um, uh, you're playing around finitely generated modules, so you're taking a quotient of a finitely generated module on each patch here. So that's going to be finitely generated module. This is a coherent shift. 
Okay, so let's do a little example, which hopefully, hopefully uh, make this uh, clearer and more concrete. We're going to look at the, uh, uh, the projective plane, P2, with homogeneous coordinates x, y, and z. Okay, so here are the three coordinate lines. Uh, z equals zero, black one, x equals zero, and y equals zero. And we'll pick the closed subset to be just given by z equals zero here. Okay, D is the z equals zero line. So we have three patches where each of these, um, which are the complements of each of these lines. Okay, so either x is non-zero, the complement of that line, or y is non-zero, or z is non-zero. So if x is non-zero, that's going to be my first patch, R1. Okay, and what is the coordinate ring there? The intelligent way to write this, if you want to write this as a subring of the ring of rational functions, intelligently written here, okay, it's going to be the polynomial ring in two variables, y on x and z on x. Okay. And uh, if you want to see, okay, so what is the ideal sheaf uh, corresponding to z equals zero? They're the ones where uh, z is zero. So that means it's just the ideal generated by z on x. Okay, so it's a proper ideal inside here. Okay, so let's look at the patch where um, y is non-zero. Since y is non-zero, you're looking at these uh, rational functions that are uh, well defined on the y non-zero, so you can divide by y. So you, you, this is just polynomial ring in two variables, x on y and z on y. And the ideal shift, that's the uh, functions which are 0 on z, so that's the ideal generated by z on y. Okay. Uh, so that's on the second patch. And on the third patch, the third affine uh, plane, which is one where z is uh, not 0, if it's not, z is not 0, then, um, then there are no functions which are 0 on z. Okay. Uh, so uh, you have k, x on z, y on z. So this here is going to be all of M3. Okay, there's no function which is zero on. Um, uh, yeah. So so the point is that on this patch, okay, you've removed all of this. So when you do this condition here, d intersect u i, this is going to be empty. Okay, so this is no condition at all. Okay, there's no condition here. Okay, you're not imposing any condition. So this ideal sh uh, sheaf here, on this patch here, is the whole ring. Okay, M3. Okay, so that's the example. It's going to be basically given by these three ideals inside the corresponding rings. And I guess the thing you might want to check is, well, let's have a little bit of a feel for what's happening with the descent data here. So normally with the descent data, R1, R2, and R3, okay, uh, it's given by the identity when you go to the, um, the intersections of two of them, the affine patches. Uh, so that's given by rings such as R12. So let's look at U1 and sec U2, for example, okay? So basically, you put all these uh, functions together. So you have y on x and x on y. They're inverses of each other. So you have y on x to the plus or minus 1. You'll also have the z on x. And you have z on y. But z on y, I guess, you can get from z on x here. And you multiply that by x on y, okay, which is already in here. So uh, you, that's going to be uh, r12. Okay, so another way you can do this is um, how do you get this? If you want to intersect it with R2, okay, basically you're going to remove y equals 0, or y on x equals 0 here, so you have to invert y on x. Okay, that's the other way of thinking about it. And similarly here, if you want to uh, intersect this, you start with this U2, okay, which is, has coordinate in this one here, and you want to remove the uh, x equals 0, okay, so that's the zeros of x on y, okay, you have to invert x on y, so that's why you have this here, okay, you have to throw in the y on x here as well, okay. So inside OX, you just have the identity of these two. Um, but what happens when you look at this ideal sheaf here, O minus D, to be uh, given by these two these three ideals? Okay. So here, on these two patches, what you do is you look at these two, and you have to tensor up with this R12. So that's just the ideal generated by Z on X for this one on one side, and the ideal generated by Z on Y on that side. Okay. But now it's the ideal generated inside here. And the point is that they're equal inside this ring. And why is that? Well, how do they differ? Well, if you divide one by the other, you'll get x on y on y and x, and that's an invertible element. So they're basically, these two elements are associates of each other. Okay? They differ by a unit, so they generate the same ideal. Okay? So that means that the identity does actually restrict to a, a, um, a descent data, proper descent data on this ideal sheaf. Okay? So this, um, uh, these uh, sub... Uh, modules of uh, R that I've given here, okay? And that gives you O minus D, given by these three uh, ideals. 
Okay, so that's the example. I hope that gives you a little bit of feel for what a coherent sheaf on a projective variety is. And let me make, make two remarks before I finish up. So the first one, I probably should have been a little bit more careful about when does this definition work. Okay, so it basically works when, well, remember, firstly we had this open cover by affine varieties. So you need all the UIs to be affine. Actually, we, uh, we should also have all the UIJs and the UIJLs up to this, the double and the triple intersections to be affine as well. And for a projective variety, it's always possible to uh, choose uh, your affine cover, so that's the case. And it's essentially essentially what we have here in this projective example, okay? So maybe we have a closed, remember, uh, projective variety is a closed, uh, uh, closed uh, subset of some projective space, so you can do this easily for projective space, okay? The usual affine patches work, okay, via affine um, spaces. Okay, and then you can restrict that to your closed subset. Okay, so that's when that works. And um, this is not the usual definition of a coherent sheaf. So remember, a sheaf is really you want to say what the uh, sections are on any open set. And the reason why uh, it's not the usual definition be is because you've chosen an affine open cover. Okay, and so it seems to depend on what that affine open cover is. But as you know, so uh, the, the point of what's going on is that uh, if you're given an affine open cover, okay, um, you've basically, by giving these modules, just by the nature of things, you've defined um, this sh uh, what, what this sheaf is on any open subset of that. Okay, so that's because you've defined it on principal open subsets, okay, and they form a basis. And once you've that, done that, you've got it on the uh, whole of this um, uh, variety. Okay, so um, it is a it is a something that's a little bit unfortunate, but actually, if you want to work with an actual coherent uh, sheaf, okay, this is usually the definition that you have. Okay, you work with it by um, usually picking a nice affine open cover, and you might as well stick to that to most computations. I hope you enjoyed this adventure in pure mathematics. <laughs>